this is a a talk about a, a deeply embedded um, application of CDIO uh, rather than looking at uh, generic issues. Um, I'm from aerospace engineering at Sydney University. Uh, we have a flight simulation facility that we try to use to demonstrate by experiential learning um, some of the more complex problems that our aeronautical students work with. Um, I deal with flight mechanics, which is basically flight stability and control, um, how an aeroplane responds to control inputs by the pilot, and also flight control design for autopilots, in other words. So this is our uh, facility. We call it our variable stability flight simulator because of the way it's designed. Um, but I might make it clear up front that we are not about teaching pilots. Uh, our students are engineering students. Um, most of them have very little flying experience. They all do about three or four hours. Um, but apart from that, they're very inexperienced. So the difficulty with this sort of situation is that trying to get the theory across in terms of how do we analyse flight dynamics and how do we design control systems to people who have very little appreciation of the dynamic responses that are occurring is very difficult. So we started developing this facility to address that problem by experiential learning. Okay, so basically the, um, the students, I particularly start talking about uh, our flight control um, component. We have a couple of courses in flight mechanics. One is just the flight stability and control. I dealt with that in uh, an Australian Association of Engineering document in uh, 2009. This work, um, was addressed in 2010. I'm going to briefly go through that in a CDIO context. And later I want to address how we're using that to now infuse the CDIO approach across more of the um, units of study in the discipline, particularly in third and fourth year. Okay, so in designing control systems, um, it's very difficult uh, without any experiential learning. Uh, we try to use the simulator because Feeling the responses makes a big difference. Um, a lot of simulation, uh, there's a lot of argument about whether motion is uh, essential, but when we're trying to show students the differences between a stable response, an unstable response, a marginally stable response, the feeling that you get through the motion is essential. And so that vestibular feedback um, is basically the critical element that allows students to see what is the difference between a good design and a bad design, okay? because they feel it instantaneously. Okay, um, it's variable stability because we can actually demonstrate to the students what a good design looks like. We can change the design in real time and show them what uh, a bad design looks like in terms of the flight control compensators that they would be designing. The initiative here in terms of CDIO is that the students actually get to embed their own designs in the simulator and fly it. Okay, so that's where the implement and operate comes from. Now, this is a complex looking table. Uh, it addresses, whoops. It addresses some of the um, uh, CDIO uh, goals um, and attributes in Ed Crawley's um, document. But basically the structure of the course in itself is that they do four assignments, starting with simple response to flight control inputs um, and looking at time domain, frequency domain issues, and also how they can analyse how an aeroplane responds to gusts, uh, wing turbulence and things like that. Um, because when they design, in their major design project, a flight control system, uh, they are basically using those um, dynamic responses and they're also making it to reject the effects of gusts. We all fly in aeroplanes, we know what this is like. Uh, turbulence is undesirable, so their controllers need to do that. The important thing is that once they get down to um, that end of the, uh, the semester, they, des they design a control system using CAD tools, MATLAB basically, and then they can actually implement their um, design in the flight simulator. We can show them uh, what a good design looks like, what a bad design lo looks like, and then they see how their design lies in that spectrum. Okay, so the design problem that they're, they're given is basically that they need to design a flight control system um, for a high order, uh, fully mobile aeroplane in six degrees of freedom. We're particularly looking at a problem here where the aeroplane's flying um, in what we call a longitudinal sense, it's climbing and we're managing the airspeed. So we want to design a control loop that designs, uh, that controls the, the climb rate um, on climb out, say, from uh, takeoff and manage the airspeed as well 
because if we start to climb without managing the airspeed, the airspeed will drop and the aeroplane will stall and fall out of the sky. The sort of a criteria that they, they're given, that they, they need to design these loops in a particular way, um, but specifically they're given some specifications in terms of what the control design uh, characteristics need to be. They're given frequency response uh, criteria, um, typical things uh, in terms of time constant, settling time, steady state error. These are standard control um, design requirements. But their solutions need to be robust to off-design conditions. So they design it for a particular airspeed altitude, but it needs to fly at a fairly large range around that um, nominal condition. But it also has to work well in the presence of disturbances. Um, this is just meant to show you the sort of form of the problem that they're working with. It's a fairly high order system. It's multi-input, multi-output. Transfer functions of fourth order uh, with nasty stuff like uh, non-minimum phase zeros, um, different time scales. So we've got fast modes and slow modes. And the conceive process comes in where they need to address um, just for starters, looking at what the overall structure of the solution would look like, but their job is basically then to design these compensators, uh, a stability augmentation system and control loops to actually manage the vertical speed and the airspeed. The things that they're, they're doing in the conception stage is looking at the structure of the, uh, the loop, the compensator types that they would use, PID, lead, lag, that sort of thing, and what order they would need to use to manage the um, responses in an acceptable way. Um, typical sorts of solutions, they're going to be using MATLAB tools. Um, whoops, many people may be God, familiar with uh, SIZO tool. It works with bode plots um, and root locus type approaches. It's just They're just working with standard classical frequency domain methods. And the sort of solutions they might get for a step response, sorry, I'm using the wrong buttons here, is a nice smooth exponential. This is a desirable one. Um, something that might have a little bit of overshoot, or if they're doing a really bad job, they might get a lot of oscillation. This would be very undesirable. The next step is they then get to implement this in the flight simulator. And here they deal with um, time domain realizations of what they've designed, uh, implementing things in a discrete fashion. These are all the real problems of, um, of applying a control solution in the time domain. They're aided in putting into the simulator because of the software structure that we need to accommodate their solutions in, um, and then they get to fly it. But I must say that whatever they design, we'll check for stability first, because uh, if they get it wrong, the simulator goes through the roof. So there's a lot of oh and that we have to, um, to cover in doing all this. So once they get to that point, they're then looking at the operating stage. Um, this is where they get the feedback on their design and uh, are able to reflect on what their time domain um, approach was like and whether they could have done anything better. Uh, they're using uh, what we call the mode control panel. This is a standard uh, autopilot interface for a 747 where they can engage the autopilot here. They can dial up in the little window here how fast they want the airplane to climb and the button engages it. So press that button, the airplane starts to climb. They're also working with uh, auto throttle here um, and the auto throttle arm and speed button basically allows them to get the thing to follow a particular sp commanded speed that they set in that button, uh, in that window there. So they're using those tools and they're using other feedback apart from the visual feedback from the outside world, uh, they're using the gauges. So we've got airspeed indications and a standard analog gauge here or digital outputs here. They've got a vertical speed indicator here that indicates how fast the airplane's climbing and the sort of thing that they're looking for is what is the dynamic response in something like this, this needle motion? Is it oscillating or is it just a nice smooth exponential convergence to the final value? Okay, and then they do the experiment and what we do is to, don't, I don't expect you to read all this stuff, it's in the paper, um, but basically we set them up in a design condition and they look at what happens with a nicely designed controller. Uh, we set them up in a off design condition, in this case the airspeed is somewhat different um, and they look at what happens with that good desi design in an off-design condition, and then we look at a bad design in both of those conditions as well. And if they've provided their own solution, they then get to embed theirs and run theirs and uh, compare it to these other two. So the sort of exercises that we do are to run the airplane open loop for starters so they can get a feel for what's going on. 
we engage the vertical speed mode so they actually turn on the autopilot and observe the motion. Um, we do that with and without the auto throttle to demonstrate what happens to the airspeed if we're controlling the, um, the airplane without managing the airspeed as well. And they also get to use the auto throttle to see how the airplane responds to an airspeed change command uh, with and without the vertical speed mode engaged because that's important for the flight stability. Okay, so a typical good solution would look something like this. Um, you see here, this is what the simulator motion it is. He's turning it on. You see the motion outside. And you see there's a nice smooth transition to the new condition where the airplane's just now flying in a nice smooth steady climb. Um, this is a good solution. It looks unspectacular. It's supposed to. Because if you were in sitting in the back of the airplane with the thing bouncing up and down, uh, you'd be rather concerned. So this is actually a good solution. It doesn't look particularly spectacular. But by the way, when the simulator's tilted up at the end of that process, that's the auto throttle kicking in to make the airspeed stay constant when it's climbing. This is a more typical student solution. This is the bad one that we use to demonstrate. And you should be able to observe the corresponding dynamic motions. And of course, if you're sitting in the back of that airplane, you wouldn't be very impressed. Okay, um, That's about as unstable as we permit one. To, to be. Most student solutions, by the way, tend to be reasonably good in the dynamic motion that we saw there, but the auto throttle isn't very good at managing the airspeed. That's a typical solution that we find. Um, so outcomes, this was reported, uh, as I said before, at AAE last year. And basically, we survey them before and after the simulation experiment uh, by their own uh, assessment of what they've done and by our assessment against some key indicators and generally found that they're getting something like 15 to 20 percent improvement in their understanding just in this half hour session. Okay, so that's what we did with one unit of study. Now the next uh, stage then is to actually try and use this idea and put it into the rest of the curriculum and bring all the other components together. In a typical um, aerospace engineering um, degree in third year, they start to do all these things that should be fairly meaningful to most people. The flight mechanics is what we've just been discussing. They design aircraft structures. They design aircraft components, just little bits, subsystems of the system, struts, air tailplanes and things like that, or a wing. Um, and they do that in third year because they don't have enough of the material to do a complete aircraft design yet. Aerodynamic studies and propulsion studies. All of these are required for their fourth year capstone process uh, course, which is actually designing a complete aircraft configuration. That's this one here. So at that point, they design a complete airplane. Um, they're looking at weight estimates, uh, aerodynamic estimates for a particular purpose. They um, design the whole thing. They estimate the aerodynamics. But in this new strategy, what we're trying to do is to incorporate these two capstone components with the third year components by allowing the fourth year students now to actually run this um, in terms of a design review process with the third year. So the component design will then be the fourth year students actually running uh, a design review process as would happen in the aer aerospace industry using the third years as a sub-design team. Okay, So they're then doing the specification and managing the um, the return data and uh, adequacy of the design solutions that the third years are using. They also then use their aerodynamic estimates to come out of this and that goes into the third year flight mechanics course so that those students start to look at the dynamic responses of the handling qualities of the aeroplane that the fourth years designed. Those students, by the way, will then do all their analysis of the aircraft uh, handling qualities using that data, but when they get into fourth year, they'll use their own design and design the control systems for their own design that they do in fourth year and implement that in the simulator and fly the control systems that they've created. So basically, this brings together a whole lot of ideas in terms of uh, how the students can be doing peer learning. This is an important process, this starter exchange and design review. Um, they're actually using their own data or the data from other students. Um, by the way, if that doesn't work, we can always provide them a good set. Um, and 
there's a path here then for reflective practice um, in terms of how the students can learn from what they've actually done in terms of their, uh, their own design. Because when they've designed the control system, they then can... Oh. Sorry about that, I'm on the wrong buttons. They then get to use that to reflect upon their own design practice. So in detail, then the particular um, data paths and the CD and the I and the O components then lie in the larger structure of the compatibility between the, the two design components and the two flight mechanics components in terms of what the conceive and design elements are, are, are going to be. These are using the C and D to design the component elements out of the larger aircraft structure that these guys have done. Um, they're doing the concept design and estimating the aerodynamics and passing that data down to here and the third years then do the implement operate on the fourth year students um, uh, conceive and design process and then of course when they come into fourth year they then do the I and the O on that and reflect back on what they've done. So we're basically looking then at a more deeply embedded um, CDIO approach dispersed through all of the third and fourth year um, units of study. Okay? Um, the key elements of it, uh, benefits of it, are that the motion-based simulation then actually gives them uh, a direct experiential uh, appreciation of the adequacy of their design. It allows them to reflect back on what their approach was and, um, and how, wo how well that worked and to, to be able to go and reevaluate their design approaches. Um, this approach throughout the uh, senior and uh, senior and junior um, curriculum is then what is allowing the students to do more of the uh, the experiential learning, if you like. But particularly, we're ta starting to pull together all of the um, aerospace components that. Uh, that are important, the aerodynamics, design, um, mechanics, uh, dynamics, and control design. And of course, they all like it. They're, they all come out of this uh, appreciating um, the ability or the, the, the opportunity, if you like, to actually implement something that they've actually created, especially if they can sit in the flight simulator and feel it. Um, everybody likes flight simulators, the students do too. That's it. <laughs>